October 2nd is the United Nations International Day of Nonviolence. It marks the birth of Mahatma Gandhi, the person who helped lead India to independence and inspired a world of nonviolent activists, including many among those seeking justice and peace in Israel and Palestine. Up next, two very special guests who took nonviolence to heart. They are young Israelis with all the hopes and dreams of typical teenagers, but the moral tenacity to stand up for their beliefs, too. There were Fusniks who, when it came to time to perform their mandatory military service, refused. Maya Wind and Netta Mishli are part of a group called the Shministim. It's Hebrew for 12th graders. They're currently on a U.S. tour with Jewish Voices for Peace and Code Pink. Well, let's, I don't know, let's start with you. Why, why 12th grade? Tell people. Uh, well, we are high school seniors. Uh, conscription in Israel is mandatory for all Jewish citizens and some non-Jewish minorities also. And uh, we are refusers. So what happens at 12th grade? You ha that's the, the last year that you have in school before you have to go and do your service. Right. That's the year where you have to go through all sorts of different uh, exams and tests to see which is the position for you. And it's the year where a lot of people build up excitement, start getting into shape for the army. And that's the year where we took the final decision and uh, not to join. You didn't get excited and started getting into shape. Uh, what happened? No. Um, well, for it's an individual uh, process for anyone so it has a different choice. But um, for me, I started in a very young age to think about it, to think if I want to go to the army, because this is not a question in Israel. It's very obvious that you're going to the army. And so the process of asking questions is, was really important. And I decided that this is not what I want to do. Um, and I was part of this group, the Shministim uh, letter. What we did is we wrote a letter that um, uh, to declare our, our refusing refuser in, in public. Now, this, has got, this tradition goes back to the 70s. But talk yeah. a little bit about how it got started. Uh, well, the first letter was in the 70s, and it was teenagers expressing their concern for the occupation right at its very start. The, there are actually only three main letters of Shministim of refusal, you know, that the letter was followed by refusal to serve. That was in 2001, 2005, and ours, which is 2008. Uh, and the movement is actually getting smaller, unfortunately. We're only 10 of us this year. Mm. To be one of those 10, what are, you, what are you risking? Well, first of all, we go to jail which is, um, it's not a nice experience. It um, definitely wasn't fun for me. Um, but this is not the most important part. The most important part is um, we risk our place in society. We're, um, we're becoming an outsiders, and this is a hard, much harder than going to jail. It's the experience wherever you go, and it doesn't matter who the new person you meet, the first question, or not the first, but one of the first questions is, what did you do in the army? Or why, in this age, what, what are you doing in the army? And having to go through this process mm -hmm. again and again of explaining and telling everyone, we didn't go because, the, because this and this and this, it's a very hard experiment. What, ha, talk a bit more about that, if you will, Maya. I mean, when you go to apply for a job, when you go to apply for housing, how often does this come up? Oh, very often, certainly at our age. Uh, first of all, most job applications after basic information have what rank did you achieve in the army uh, and, and the like. And so if you don't have a rank to brag about and you don't have good army experience, that certainly makes you less uh, desirable. Certainly if the employer actually bothers to ask you why you didn't serve and you explain, most Israelis will turn you down right away. So you have this huge cost that you're risking, this huge possible price that you're risking for what you've done. Why did you decide to do it? Maya? Uh, well, it's a very long story. It's a long thought process. It didn't happen in one day. It happened over four years. But I think I drew some basic links. Uh, first of all, I, I drew the link between terrorism and the occupation, which was a link that was hard for me to draw. I always assumed the Palestinians were bombing Israel because they didn't believe in its right to exist or they hated Jews. That, was I w that, that is what I was taught. Uh, but once I started to realize that we were oppressing millions of people, violating their basic human rights, and to what end and with what ju justification? When I realized there is no justification and that we have no right to do this, uh, then I really realized I could not take part in this. Mm. You want to tell your part of the story? It's kind of similar, I think. I was um, asking lots of questions. I think this is the key. Um, 
I, w I wanted to know why. Why there is terrorism? Why did they want to kill us? Why? All the stuff that I learned as assumption, as, as true. Who did and you ask? I started with my parents, and when I didn't get a good answer, I started going to, to politics, to all kinds of organizations. Um, and in the end, I had to see it in my own eyes. I went to the West Bank. This was my final um, you know, step. And when I saw what's going on, I realized I can't participate with, with that. I can't take part in the occupation. Now, you make it sound part. like an easy step to go to the West Bank, but not easy. How did you do it? I, I joined demonstrations against the wall, with anarchists against the wall. Um, it's not so hard. It's 25 minutes away from us, um, from Tel Aviv, uh, where I live. And um, it's, it's a hard in your mind to say, I'm going to go to the West Bank to speak with Palestinians. But once you decide you want to do it, you want to see the other side, which is not really other. I mean, it's, they're like us. They want some of them, most of them want peace, like I want peace, so I didn't feel like it's the other side. I, it was just a different aspect of the same story, and I wanted to talk to, to people who have to, who has to ex experience the occupation. Of Why did you go look for yourself, too? Yeah, I also went to the West Bank. I mean, I, I had grown up in a religious school, and a lot of my friends were settlers from the West Bank, and I'd been to settlements and outposts on playdates very often as a child, uh, but that was one side of the West Bank. I remember in my very beginning of a career as a peace activist in the West Bank, I was about 15 at the time, and I remember the first time I went there, I was terrified. I was sure that if I told someone I was Jewish or Israeli, I would be shot to death. Uh, and, you know, I, it, I had to get over that fear. And then slowly, slowly, I, I came to realize that there are so many Palestinians who would welcome me with open arms, certainly with the opinions I hold, but not even. Uh, and that, you know, they weren't nearly as hostile as I was taught.